today uh, we're going to cover some topics. These are um, <coughs> a collection of things where uh, touching on various aspects of the market and uh, some, some, of the, uh, some of the stuff here also includes my own research over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, and so we'll uh, talk about those and try to relate it back to the, to the material here in class. Okay, so um, is greed good? Well, uh, how, how many of you have seen the original uh, Michael Douglas movie? What was the name of the movie? I've, uh, Wall, Street. Wall Street, the main Wall Street, yes. So tell our papers, right? You remember the famous speech, greed is good. If you haven't seen it, I, I highly recommend that movie. The first one, not the second one so much. Um, so the whole idea behind, well, not a whole idea, but the, so this 17th century economist, I mean, you may have heard of him, uh, Adam Smith. Um, so, his, uh, so he talked about the fact that if, if all of us individually do our own thing without paying attention to any attention to anybody else, collectively society is good, better off as a result. So if all of us selfishly pursue our own little goals of maximizing our own wealth, then collectively society does well. Okay, that, that, so that sort of, and it has been sort of described in different ways by different authors. Um, it's called the invisible hand idea. That, um, and, and basically it's what I just, just told you. And uh, so, now, and how does that, how does that relate to, to us? I mean, so, so the idea again, you know, and this has been, used in a lot of ways in modern economy to explain a lot of things as to, you know, that it's okay to be selfish because if we are all selfish, then collectively society does well. And so, um, uh, so that relates back to insider trading. Um, insider trading, um, again, is a selfish act. A lot of times one may argue that if you have, now when we talk about insider trading here, we're talking about illegal insider trading. So there are two kinds of insider trading. One is a legal kind of insider trading where senior corporate officials are allowed to trade. They're, they're legal insiders of a company and they are allowed to trade but their trades have to be declared. Uh, they have to file an intent to trade, then wait 60 days, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of, uh, um, they, they are tied with a lot of regulations and restrictions as to how and when they can trade. Uh, that's simply because corporate insiders have a lot of information about their own companies. And insiders, when we say corporate insiders, we talk about C CEOs, CFOs, uh, all the chief you know, financial officers, chief executive officers, chief operational officer. So the, the very top of a corporate chain, uh, people have information and, and their trades are called legal insider trades because those trades are legal. You, you, there are certain regulations they have to follow to buy or sell stock, um, their own company stock that is. So, but here we're talking about illegal insider trading. So this is a different discussion here. We're talking about illegal insider trading. So uh, people are trading based on information that they are not supposed to have and then obviously they're not supposed to trade on it. Now, when we talk about this also, the illi um, unstated assumption is that these are people who are making money. Because if you Ill trade illegally and you lose a ton of money, guess what? The SEC doesn't really care. Um, so it's only when you trade illegally with stuff you're not supposed to have and you make a ton of money, that's when it, it uh, shows up or fl is flagged at the, at the regulatory level. And then they try to investigate and see if they can tie you to, to those trades in some way. Um, it is also very hard to process these kind of cases. For every 100 investigations that the SEC begins on potential insider trading, uh, one or two only come up for trial level, uh, go to the next level. Most of them are dropped because obviously there's a lot of circumstantial evidence at work. There is, it's very hard to establish um, intent and all that good stuff. So, but, but that said, uh, there is a huge arm of the Securities and Exchange Commission that deal with insider trading. So they actually have a lot of resources invested in, in, um, in dealing with or uh, trying to deal with illegal insider trading. Now, before we talk about it, so, so there is this whole 
argument as to whether this kind of trading should be legal. Okay, there's a whole big debate in, in the academic and policy uh, realms about, about whether we should even make this illegal. Why make it illegal? Because supporters of insider trading, to legalize insider trading, argue that it, it is really a victimless crime, that it doesn't really hurt anybody. Which is actually true, because when you look at, um, when you, when you look at these kind of prosecution, you cannot really turn, to, uh, turn and say, okay, person X was damaged as a result of person Y trading on the basis of illegal information. It, th that correlation doesn't exist. And therefore, it is widely referred to as a victimless crime, that, uh, that no individual really is getting hurt as a result of people trading based on illegal information. Uh, so that's one. And then, of course, there's the other argument that it makes Ill illegal insider trading makes prices informative. Uh, and that's a good thing. When prices become informative, markets become efficient. And so that's a good thing. So that's why supporters of illegal insider trading use, make these two points. Critics of this or the ones that support the ban on illegal trading. By the way, it's legally currently, it's illegal currently. Under current statutes, uh, it is illegal. But there is a big, there's always been a debate as to wh why not make it legal. And, and so I just gave you the other side. And, and so people who support the ban of, on illegal insider trading argue that it's psychologically harmful, that there is a psychological reason to, to allow the ban to continue. And there's a market confidence argument that if, so the idea is that if you, if you allow certain people uh, this to get away with it, that overall affects the market's confidence and people will stay away from the market. That's the idea. So, it, so it's a lot like the argument that was made in the late uh, last century or in the 19th century, okay? So late 18th century and early 19th century when Wall Street was without too many rules. It was considered to be the Wild West and uh, almost anything went. And uh, um, there were a few robber barons as they were called in those days, the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts that essentially did whatever they wanted. It was their playground. They, if they had somebody challenging them, they would have them killed or moved or do whatever, make them ruin them financially, and they could get away with it. You know? so, um, and, and the common man stayed away. So it was considered to be a playground of the rich and famous and wealthy and so on, and, and, and middle class people and, and ordinary folks stayed away from the stock markets. So that's sort of the same idea here, that the, you know, if, if people lose confidence in the market, uh, then uh, people start to stay away. Individuals like us would stay away, and that's not a good thing. So those are the... Um, but there's also a third argument about, uh, related to insider trading and the damage it can do, is that when there is a lot of illegal trading going on, uh, the spreads, bid-ask spreads would widen because uh, there's a lot of informational uncertainty and risk and therefore the spreads widen. And that's, obviously that makes it costly for everybody to trade when spreads are wide. So, okay. So um, with that in mind, there's an example of, of, of uh, insider trading. A lot of the stuff is not visible because a lot of the insider trading that the, the prosecutors have gone out against are settled uh, privately and, and, and the data doesn't really come to light. You don't see that. But in one particular case, this is a paper I worked on in the 90s uh, with a colleague from Cranert, uh, looking at Ivan Bosky's illegal trading. The reason we had this data was because one of us was a consultant. My co-author was a consultant in, in, in the trial, actual trial of Ivan Bosky. And so a lot of his, his individual trades were put together by lawyers. And so we had that information based on how he actually traded on a particular company that he had illegal information on. And, um, and, and so what, what we, uh, there are two things. Well, one of the things that we found in this particular research was that, um, well, he, 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 he was caught. I mean, those are the, the, the headlines. He paid a big fine. He was banned for security, from securities trading for life et cetera, et cetera. But from a research standpoint, what we found was that Bosky's trades, which we know because they were, we knew exactly what his trades, which one were his trades and what time on a, on a particular stock. It was actually Carnation stock, if you remember. Um, you know Carnation Milk and all the milk products. So the same company. And he, he spent a ton of money, a few million dollars, buying up uh, 
Carnation shares illegally um, with information that he had purchased from one of the top, one of his informants. And so we, we, we looked at that stock and his purchase of stock, Carnation stock, and we found that um, Bosky's impact, the impact of Bosky's trades and the bo impact of non Bosky trades around the same time contemporaneously were statistically similar. In other words, Bosky's trades did not have anything unusual going with it from a statistical standpoint. And so our argu argument was that how can you, how can you accuse uh, this guy of, of illegal insider trading and, and the impact it had on markets? Because that was what the other side, Carnation's lawyers were trying to say, was that because of Bosky's illegal trading, Carnation stock went up beyond where it should have been, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole big uh, story on that. And, and the economic argument was that there was no evidence to suggest that Bosky's actions had any more of a, any differential impact on the market relative to non Bosky trades that were happening at the same time in the same direction. So, anyway, the case was settled. So, um, there was another uh, very famous uh, uh, insider trading involving Martha Stewart, which some of you or all of you may have been familiar with. This was in, or, or at least subsequently been familiar with, uh, because a lot of you were quite young. <laughs> 13 years ago. Um, and so, um, but, but what happened was that uh, she um, had information about an impending bad news on this particular company in which she owned shares. And she had a private information. Privately, she was informed that something bad is going to break on this company. And so she instructed her broker to sell before the news became public. That was the whole idea, right? And so in, in doing so, she avoided over $45,000 in losses. Now, keep this in perspective. This is a woman who is worth uh, at least a billion dollars in that time. Uh, so 45000 was really chump change for her. But she did it. And then um, <laughs> that really didn't get her in trouble as much as the fact that when she, then she tried to cover it up by instructing her broker to lie. That's what really got her. If you read the charges, you'll see that she could have probably avoided, had she just said, yeah, I, I panicked, I made a mistake, you know, forgive me, and paid her fines and moved on, nothing would have happened. And, and this is a lesson for all of us here in this room, is that usually what gets us is not the act itself. It's what we try to do after that, to fix it. That's what gets us in trouble. So to keep that in mind. If you screw up in life, whatever, in whatever capacity, then just apologize, you know, and, and move on. Take your lumps and move on. Don't try to fix it. And, and, and that's what gets you in trouble more than the act itself, is the fixing part of it afterwards. And that's essentially what happened to her. And so um, she uh, did some time in a, in a low a security prison. All right, and then, of course, there's the, the classic, Jonathan Lebed. This actually was uh, a 16-year-old who, um, in the early days, in the mid to late 90s, um, when things were getting started, really exciting in the, in the penny, you know, in, when we went through the dot-com phase, the bubble, um, he um, started trading as a 16-year-old in his bedroom computer and, and started betting on these penny stocks, stocks that trade in pennies. And, uh, and he had a very interesting technique, which actually subsequently has been done, repeated many times, sort of like a, uh, um, or, um, a sor a sort of like when we t talk about all the, you know, the, the pyramid schemes and, and all that. We all know about pyramid schemes, but it keeps happening in various ways. And, and so it's the same story here. And it's um, what he would call or do is he would uh, take a position in these penny stocks, or particular penny stock, and then he would go to these various bulletin boards and, f and just, just fill it up with all kinds of positive stuff about the stock. And, and then he would uh, post all these hyped up messages. And, and a lot of, in, mo in most cases, people would bite. And some people say, oh, there must be something going on. And so a lot of people would buy shares in that company, drive up the price. And he had already taken a position earlier, so he would sell at the end and keep the difference as his profit. As, uh, and he did this number of times, number of stocks, and made over uh, $800,000 in profits. 
starting with a few thousand dollars. So, and, and pretty good for a 16-year-old, right? I mean, that's a smart kid. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, he was flagged by the SEC. And, and like I said, insider trading cases are very, very hard to. And he didn't really have insider trading. All he was doing was he, he was giving, posing these, posting these incredibly positive um, messages about these stocks that he already had positions in. Right? And so you say, oh, this is great stock. It's the best thing to have happened since X. Uh, you know, it's going to go up 2,000%. I, I believe it's going to. And so he would, he would post all these things in, in all of these boards, message boards. And, and obviously, it was a successful strategy because people would bite. And a lot of people would start to buy those shares. The prices would go up. And then he would sell uh, with the profit you know, because you know, he'd bought low, and then he'd sell high. So anyway, finally, in the end, um, he was, uh, there was a negotiated settlement. He paid about $285,000 in fines, made no admission of guilt, and kept over $600,000 out of uh, his uh, trades. Not bad, right? Um, so uh, this is uh, stealth trading. So, so early on, there was a number of a few years back, um, I, I, this is a, a, a work that I did. Um, and uh, so the idea was that how do inform traders trade? If you have somebody with information, uh, a lot of you know, traders have private information. How do you trade? Because one thing that our Bosky experience taught us, the Ivan Bosky experience, was that when uh, you are tagged or identified as a key player or a trader who trades on information, illegally obtained or otherwise, a lot of people make a career out of following you. So they watch your every move. So in fact, um, when we were working on the Bosky stuff, we noticed that there was a whole, like groupies, you know, rock and roll, uh, rock stars have groupies. Bosky had his own groupie, set of trader groupies who would basically follow him. Because their whole l l um, challenge in life was to keep track of what Bosky was trading what stocks Bosky was trading, and then trade those stocks, mimic his tr uh, trading strategy. So Bosky would take elaborate precautions to hide his motives. So he had f a number, I mean, I'm saying, thinking maybe over 20 shell companies uh, incorporated in various parts of the world, in Cayman Islands and all the Bahamas. And, and they had all these in, you know, names that are, you know, names that mean nothing, company, these are shell companies. And Bosky would trade through all of these companies just to hide his trading intent, right? So it's, it's sort of like what a lot of famous actors and actresses do in Hollywood, like when they go out and they have the paparazzi waiting to take a picture and sell while they disguise themselves, you know, put on their hats and, and wigs and things like that. So that was sort of how what Bosky was doing with his trades in real life was uh, he was trying to disguise it every which way. And these people were trying to figure out. So it was a cat and mouse game going on. So we knew that. So I, you know, we, we'd already seen that. So the idea was, OK, so if you are a Bo Bosky tra like trader, somebody like him, what are some of the things you can do to disguise your trades? Well, it turns out that one of the things you can do, of course, as I told you, is to open a number of shell companies, uh, disguise your trades. I mean, if you have that kind of money, it's, it, you can do that. Various parts of the world, and then these trades come in, and hopefully it fools some people, and you can, you can make your trades without too att attracting too much attention. W another thing you can do is you can try to break up your trades into smaller size chunks. So let's say you have information. You want to buy a few million shares off of IBM because you know something. Maybe you know it legally, maybe you know it illegally. The point is you want to make that trade. And the idea is that you want to make that trade without alerting anybody in the market. Because the moment you alert people that something's happening and you know something about a stock, guess what everybody else is going to be doing? They're going to be jumping in, and at the same time you are, and drive up the price. And that defeats the whole purpose because you want to, the whole purpose of your getting this information is to make the trade quietly and at a low price. You want to buy quietly, get in on the action without attracting too much attention, which means you don't drive the price up too much. Ideally, you don't drive the price up at all. So what you can do was, one of the things you could do was to break up your trade. So you want to buy $2 million worth of shares. You break it up into a number of 1,000 uh, orders of you know, 500 shares or less and, and make your trades quietly. In, in little chunks over a couple of days through your brokers, various brokers. 
So, so that was the thing, and it was uh, uh, the term was stealth trading. So, and 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 we showed that um, that indeed that this kind of a phenomenon was happening. It was one of the first papers that showed it, and um, and we statistically had some tests. We showed how informed traders hide behind these smaller size trades, and they're called stealth trades, and uh, how it impacts the market. So. Um, Okay, so, so that's, and since then it has been verified by researchers for stocks uh, all over the world in different exchanges and options markets and commodities markets. So it turns out it's a fairly robust phenomenon. Um, I had only shown it for the New York Stock Exchange stocks. But then subsequently it's been verified to be robust in every part of the world, in every market. So that's pretty cool. All right. So, okay. Ooh. Yes. On what grounds is stealth trading different from insider trading? Excellent question. So, insider trading is, is really um, trading on information that you shouldn't have, illegal information. It does not have to say anything about how. Okay? It just says that, yes, you are, you are, you're trading based on stuff you're not supposed to have. You're playing with toys you're not supposed to play with. That's all. Insider trading discussion stops right there. The how question does not occur into that discussion. What the sell trading paper showed was how they can do it. So that, that's how they're different. Because the, the stealth trading idea it addresses the next step in the thing is how they trade. One of the ways they might trade with that illegal information is through this breaking up the trade into numerous small pieces and trading and to show the, that those kind of things happen. So that's, that's how they are different. Okay, um, why, is pump <laughs> why is pump and dump illegal? Uh, good question. Uh, pump and, well, again, this is not my rule. This is how the SEC looks at it. SEC looks at the fact that um, you are, you and I, unless we have a securities trading license, we are not allowed in a public forum to give our opinions well, or, or to express a view about a stock, right? So, so, and it's a gray area, granted. I mean, pump and dump is not, it, it's, it's, a meant, it's an attempt meant to defraud investors. So, so for example, if you can establish, and this is a very difficult if to establish, if you can show that you have evil, uh, evil intent that you were deliberately trying to mislead people, the widows and orphans, so to speak, of their money by pr providing this wildly speculative predictions about stocks with no basis in fact. If, these are all big ifs to, to establish, by the way, which is why the SEC settled with him, right? If you can show that, then you can argue that you are exploiting somebody. <laughs> you're exploiting a group of people. You're, you're, you're exploiting the naive people. You're exploiting the innocent uh, into, into buying things that they shouldn't be buying. It's a weak argument, which is pretty much why the SEC couldn't bring a formal case against Lebed, Lebed and, and had to settle with him. So that's sort of the idea. <coughs> Are there any laws, guidelines uh, that keep young teenagers from participating in the stock market? None that I'm aware of. There's no age, age limit on participating in the market. Pump, uh, pump and dump schemes are popular with uh, uh, altcoins or Bitcoin copies? Probably. Will there be a review session <laughs> before the exam next week? No, no, I'm just kidding. I joke. Yes. How often are people prosecuted for insider trading? How, what are the odds that I will be prosecuted? You will be <laughs> trading the stock of the company I work for based on insider information. But are you doing it anonymous? Um, does the amount I trade in terms of, does the amount I trade? So here's a good story. Uh, this, this reminds me of a story. So, um, so let's say you're working in a company, right? And, and, and you found out for whatever means, that there's going to be some great breaking story coming up in your company in the next month. There's going to be some great partnerships that have you've, your company has signed up with. It's still very private, hush hush. You happen to be sharing a restroom with the top official, and in between you found out, you know, whatever. You shouldn't have known this information. You have it. All right, so 
what do you do with it? Now you're, you're like, you know, bursting together. You know something, right? And about your company. So what do you do? You, uh, let's say you're a married man. We'll, we'll make you a married man in this example. So you meet your father-in-law for dinner and you say, hey, guess what? I know something, you know. If you have money, put into it. You know, to put into it, I know our company stock is going to go through the roof in the next month. Put in whatever you have, you know, whatever you can muster up, put into this company, X. <coughs> so your father-in-law goes crazy, right? He believes in you and he just puts in like, you know, $250,000 into this thing. And, uh, and sure enough, month goes by and, uh, and the company stock goes up 20% and your father-in-law is like, you know, you're, you're his best friend now. Um, so, well, and turns out that along with everything else, the SEC has also started an investigation on your father-in-law. Um, and that actually happened. This is actually part of a true story. Um, and so, <laughs> And, and these kind of cases, that one was actually easier to prosecute because the family connection. You know, you had, so again, all of these are circumstantial. All, understand that these are all circumstantial cases. Insider trading cases are usually circumstantial. But when you have a pretty convincing circumstantial train of, chain of events established, then it's pretty difficult. And I, I think they, were fu they had to cough up all their profits. The father-in-law had to cough up profits and pay fines, et cetera. So obviously, the, the love, uh, uh, love was short-lived. But um, uh, it, it did happen. So if you want to, <laughs> if, you, if you are doing what you think, what I, you know, whatever, you, you want to do something like that, then just be careful about who you give the information to, et cetera, and whether it can be tied back to you directly through familial connections or elsewhere, things like that. So those are the things that SEC looks for is who traded, what was the connection, whether there's any family, relative, or whatever, working in the same company. So there's a lot of detective work that goes on into this stuff. And Leah, uh, Professor Chikorodi did teach a market strong trade with plus. Oh, well, that's a long time ago. Well, we'll come to that. He's a good-looking He's a good looking guy with the... Um, all right, and uh, yeah, and I taught him, and look what happened, right? So that's not yeah, a that's good important. thing. <laughs> do, do you guys know who I'm talking about, Marcus Schrenker? Okay, well, well, we're getting there. We're getting there. Don't worry. We'll come there. It's, it's coming up. Uh, so, um, all right. So we've already talked about this. Yeah, we've talked about this. Okay, so what does it mean for invest? So you're saying, okay, so this, this idiot standing in front of the class is telling us about all these things that, you know, can, can investors can do. What does it mean for us? Like, you know, all of us. How does it help us? Well, Here's the thing. So we have shown that certain types of trades have a larger than normal impact in the market, namely medium-sized trades, okay, whatever that means. Let's, let's keep the discussion general, right? So we've said that when large trades don't have that kind of impact, small trades don't, medium, intermediate-sized trades have an unusual price impact. So we can, there's a way to write code uh, to on a daily basis in real time with using real time trade data where you can keep track of the degree of market impact on trade sizes of various types right so you can actually look at trade sizes of say 0 to 500 shares 500 to 999 1000 to 4999 5,000 to 9,900 you can actually create these various classes of trade sizes and look at calculate now you know, it requires some statistical programming and stuff, but it's, it's eminently doable. Um, you can actually keep track of how the market is reacting to these intermediate sized trades. And if you see at some point you have put in these triggers, it's basically a version of algor algorithmic trading, algo trading. If, you can, if, the, so if the, those flags are tripped, that means there is something go going on with intermediate sized trades that they're sort of behaving funny, they're abnormal impact, price impact suddenly on a, on a given day, in a given time period, et cetera, then what you can conclude is that there's information, informed trading going on in that stock. That means insiders, illegally or legally, are active in that market at that time. So if you can, if you can get a sense of that, then you can jump in and buy. And that's perfectly legal. There's nothing illegal about that. All you're doing is you're using market data to, to, to uh, direct your behavior. That is totally legal. Okay, and so, and, and it turns out that there are, there are research firms that do that for, uh, you can buy, uh, I don't know if it's here, did you put that in? No. Um, 
I, I actually found a, a, a company, a, a trading company that actually, and they had my paper as a citation in that website, but they actually can buy a subscription to that website and they will give you email alerts when that stealth trading condition is stripped on given stocks on a given day and then it's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. So they will get an alarm or, or an email telling you so and so stock is showing unusual behavior. Okay, so so people are trying to make money out of that kind of strategy. All right, so that's all right. So uh, loss of control. So now we 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 delve into the psychology. Um, what does when we when we, what is loss of control when when we feel panicked or when things are not going well? The economy is doing you know badly. Uh, people are losing jobs. Uh, factories are closing down. That creates a sort of loss of control in, in ourselves as investors and as people. And it makes us feel powerless. It changes the view, way we view the world. And, um, <clears throat> and it makes us connect dots in ways that shouldn't be connected. We, we imagine things. We imagine the boogeyman you know, around the corner where, where there may not be any boogeyman. And um, so suddenly things take on a life of its own. And it's been shown by numerous researchers over time. Uh, the glass field's half empty. And, and uh, so um, in, 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 in experiments, various experiments, researchers have shown that uh, once you can strip people of a sense of loss of control and get them to make certain trading-related decisions, that, um, that, that they behave in certain ways that, um, that, that lead to increased risk. Uh, and then um, the, you can, that in turn can increase volatility and uncertainty. Uh, there were um, so um, as an investor, it's it's critical to separate, uh, you know, uh, what you can truly control from what's beyond your control. So there are things you can control. There are things you, you that you don't you don't control, and it's important to separate one from the other. And um, so, so, so the, the, and when you, if you're investing, that's one of the things that you need to be careful about is that just because other people are behaving in an irrational manner does not mean that you should join them, okay? In fact, um, when you look at uh, pronouncements from, you know, savvy investors like Warren Buffett and others, the one thing that comes out very clearly is that when people are exiting, when people are falling over themselves to get out, the smart ones are getting in. The smart ones get in at precisely the time when everybody is trying to leave, like get the, exit the markets. That's when the real smart ones enter the market because those are the greatest buying opportunities. Because when people panic, people are dumping shares of perfectly good companies that are just caught up in the, in the hoopla and um, the smart ones are the ones that buy precisely at those times because that's when you pick up the best buys and the best value for your invest investments. So that's sort of one of the keys to, uh, keys to you know, successful investors is that they're very opportunistic. They wait for their time. They're very patient. They don't get emotionally involved with uh, decision making. And they, they just ruthlessly wait for others to exit and then they jump in and, and buy up companies on the cheap. And that's, it works. So, uh, and so here's a, a little bit on, on this latest uh, a big Ponzi scheme that we are aware of with Bernard, Bernie Madoff. Um, and uh, Bernie Madoff um, has been, he was doing this stuff for the last 25, 30 years. And, um, you know, this, this pyramid scheme that he was running. And the reason why he continued to, I mean, normally Ponzi schemes don't last as long. They, they, they um, um, unravel um, way sooner than 30 years or so that this guy had a chance to run it, uh, it without, uh, well, without really creating widespread suspicion, although they were now, it, it turns out that there were a lot of red flags along the way, but people simply ignored it. Um, but this guy was a consummate insider. I mean, he was the, he would sit in the NASDAQ board, he was well known in the investment community. He was a regulator for some time. So he was, 
the literally the the fox guarding the chicken coop, right? I mean, he was that guy who was the fox and and in charge of regulation, and and he was pulling it at the same time. He was running his own Ponzi scheme, and and so um, and if you look at this, he had this set up this exclusive feeder uh, network of people that he, you know, and that included international banks you know, Ivy League college endowment funds, <clears throat> large mutual funds. <clears throat> uh, in Florida, all the, you know, wealthy people were dying to put their money and invest their money with Madoff funds. Um, you know, and so it was, it was, and he had set up, cultivated carefully this aura of exclusivity. And that's the thing, is when you make yourself exclusive, then people have this psychological thing to come to you because you're so hard to, to invest with. And so people would like fall over themselves to try and get their money in with Bernard Madoff because he was very, very, you know, discerning with whose money he took and you had to, you know, um, have certain in and not everybody could get in. And so that created the sense of, of exclusive stuff that, you know, oh my God, I have to have it now kind of. That's how people felt. And, and this is not, these are not we're not talking about individuals like you and I. We're talking about sophisticated, really wealthy uh, people, including people uh, you know, like, like the Steven Spielbergs and, and Columbia University endowment funds and you know, all this Ivy League level of endowments that were dying to, to invest in, and had invested their money with Bernard Madoff. So, um, so on the face of it, this is what he was, he was doing. I mean, he was trying to buy these calls and put options and create these straddles and stuff. But when people look, go, went back and analyzed what he was doing, really this was a tip of the drop in the ocean. I mean, most of his money was simply being used to pay off new investors and, and, and he kept the cycle going. But on the front, he had this kind of uh, option trading strategy that he claimed he was using to uh, with uh, all the money that he was getting from his investors. Um, anyway, I, I, I won't dwell into it. But here are some of the, some of the red flags that people have now uncovered uh, that were systematically overlooked during the time. Uh, there was no structure. Nobody really knew who was auditing the, the books. Uh, unusual free fee structure, heavy family influence. Not too many people, out, outsiders, were led into what was going on. Uh, there was not a whole lot of staff members that were, you know, he was running trillion dollars in terms of investor funds, but there were like one or two people managing everything supposedly. That, um, so there was a, um, you know, those are very, very unusual things. Um, extreme secrecy, um, and, um, and he would pay 8 to 12% year after year, quarter after quarter, regardless of what the market was doing. And so that, in hindsight, is, is, is just not possible. You can't do that, continue to do that, but he was doing it and nobody questioned it. That was the whole thing. So in terms of, um, in terms of losses, the, 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 the one in, in sort of the brick color thing is the, because we don't have the, we've lost our, our uh, labels, but the one on the extreme right is the Bernard Madoff. So it pales everything else that had happened before that. This, the losses involved with his stuff are uh, over $50 billion. Which, which was way more than what you know, anybody else had done before that. Uh, are there any questions, Michael, that I? Oh, yes, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so here are some of the victims of Madoff. And so you can see, you can recognize pretty much all of these names. Um, Here's another one, um, uh, another Madoff-like fraud. This includes, involves an Amish man, 77 year old. Um, again, I'll let you look through it. And this is Marcus Schrenker. He was actually one of our uh, majors. He graduated in 94, I think, from our program. Um, after this all came about, I actually went back and, and I remembered this guy uh, because uh, he was always very personable. He would come up and talk to you and after class. He was not particularly bright, but he was very, very engaging as a personality, as, as a person. 
Um, but so that's in his heydays. Um, he's now in prison. Um, so um, so he would. Uh, so here's a brief look at what he did. Um, so he had this. Uh, financial planning organization, the thing that he, f you know, he, he started with a degree from our financial planning program. And, um, and he would invest, uh, you know, to, basically he was churning the accounts and, and he was uh, not really doing, so he was, he was investing a lot, a lot of buying, a lot of selling and generating commissions. And he had this deal with his bro these brokers that were in his network that they were all uh, kicking back the commissions uh, to him, part of the commissions. And so he was making good money and, and, and the reason he came to fame was so he, the, there was an arrest warrant out for him in Indianapolis so he had a private plane one of those planes that you saw in that initial picture so he actually staged his own death so he he flew out and then he ditched the plane in air over Alabama and the plane crashed obviously somewhere but he he, he ejected out with his parachute landed somewhere in Alabama had mo motorcycle kept in one of the garages there, and he drove the motorcycle out. And it was, can't make this up, right? And so anyway, he was caught. Was, the short end of it was he was caught, and, uh, and uh, he's now in prison. Marriage is over, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, uh, it's not a happy ending, but a sad ending, actually. Um, so yeah, um, and, and, uh, and so he used his network of friends and stuff to, to bring in money, and then he basically, uh, uh, investing in rather than investing in mutual funds as he was promising, he was uh, he was uh, he was basically churning. This is a well-known term called churning, where you keep buying and selling uh, in in somebody's account, and obviously when you do that, you're you're generating commissions because every time you buy, every time you sell, you have to. And so he had brought in he he would you know the people he was trading through uh, were incurring the commissions and then kicking back a portion of the commissions to him um, and stuff among other things. Here's another real estate fraud example. I mean, uh, there's a ton. I, I'll let you read these. Um, and then uh, here's the collapse. Uh, this is little Marcus Schrenker. Uh, in an attempt, uh, so I told you about the stage, the plane crash. And so in uh, 2010, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Okay, so um, so characteristics of fraud. There are some characteristics of fraud. It's usually hidden, of course, no surprise there. <coughs> Losses tend to increase at higher levels in the organization. They tend to start small, grow over time. Nearly all fraud can be detected if red flags are, are, um, uh, are not ignored, then you can detect them. So it turns out that there were always these flags that people discover after the fact. Nobody bothers to question them, even with Madoff. It, it, even you know, 10 years before the whole thing blew up, there were people who were constantly trying to say that this guy's doing something shady. He should be investigated. His books should be investigated. Nothing happened. Nobody did anything. And so, um, <coughs> so who, who commits fraud? Men commit roughly three out of four. All right? So this is a, a gender-biased crime. And, uh, so... Um, uh, the 10-80-10 uh, the rule, 10% of the workforce would never take anything, 80% of the workforce would take something if the circumstances were right, 10% of the workforce would take something regardless of the circumstances. So that's sort of the well-known 10-80-10 rule. Um, what is the motive? Why do people do it? Well, here's some well-known uh, you know, responses. Uh, gambling, bad investments, uh, impatience for the good life, drug alcohol abuse, family debt, extramarital affairs, need to meet productivity targets, uh, opportunity. Um, an opportunity to commit fraud can be real or can be perceived. Those who think they will get caught rarely commit it. Okay, if you think you're going to get caught, you're not going to do it. You're going to be too scared to do it. Um, th there, there are some common motives uh, that have been found that people have investigated and found. So. Um, Lack of segregation of duties, lack of controlled access to vendor master file, uh, lack of control of vendor master, this is the Snowden situation, that's the Edward Snowden kind of case. Uh, lack of accounts payable controls, Fox in charge of the hen house, that's the Bernie Madoff stuff, 
outpost effect where you're out there. This is actually also Snowden, uh, Snowden because Snowden was in Hawaii in, in a facility which was not as heavily guarded as <coughs> in the mainland. <coughs> um, then some of the rationalization that people do to, to justify what they do. Um, I'm only borrowing the money, right? So people say, I'm borrowing it, I'll put it back. You know, Everybody else is doing it. Why, why can't it be me? Um, company owes me big. You know, I've put in my bl blood, sweat, you know, the company for X number of years, and I'm underpaid. I didn't get my bonus because my boss took credit for my work. My favorite, I'm bored. Uh, so, um, uh, fraud prevention and detection. Be wary of opportunists to invest your money in franchise or investments that require you to so be, be very careful, as I said, be very skeptical. It's your money, ask questions. One of the problems that you see with these things repeatedly is that people don't ask questions. They're too afraid to ask questions. And, and that's one of the, the, the recurring themes in these problems after the fact. Uh, if something appears to be too good to be true, it probably is. That's a well-known. Uh, have a, an anonymous promoter. If there's an anonymous promoter behind the time, that's a problem. It requires you to sign non-disclosure or non-circumvention agreements. That's a problem. Um, do, not investing in, do not invest in anything unless you understand what you're investing in. That's a key thing. That's where the asking questions part becomes important. Um, due diligence, independently verify. Do your homework, basically. Um, check with Better Business Bureau. How does a Ponzi scheme succeed? Now, this is tongue-in-cheek, of course. Uh, don't expand too fast, show bad numbers once in a while, run while you're ahead. 